Uh, anyway, so uh, I hope you're ready for the next session. Our music team, maybe you can just put the music Kidogo Chini sound team at the back. I uh, hope you're ready for the next session um, uh, and keep learning, keep taking notes. Uh, tomorrow we continue adding. Remember, this is four days. And so, uh, Apmo is the one who says, when you're juggling many balls in the air, you only have like microseconds to touch each ball, yeah? But to still have an impact for you to go high enough so that you are able to touch the rest. And so with that, as the information comes, keep processing as quickly as you can. Keep asking yourself, what am I going to do with this information? So that when the new one comes, you're not going like, oh, there's too much. No. Keep processing. Keep asking yourself, what's the one thing I can do? What's the one takeout I can take from this? Even as you keep processing through the sessions. And so ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, let me welcome on stage again, Pastor Moredi Wanjao. Yes, yes. Come on, come on, you can stand, you can clap, you can welcome our pastor. Yeah. Welcome, Pasi. Thank you, thank you. By the way, uh, this is afternoon, so they've opened the flaps for airflow. If you feel like you're falling asleep, just stand and name. Uh oh. <laughs> just stand and name around. You can go and stand on the side. I will not be offended, okay? Seriously, don't, just, the last, just don't sleep. Just walk, the, do whatever you need to do. And then when you are recovered, you can come back. Amen? Yeah, so please sit. Um, my wife dared me to tell you a story by Bishop Doug, uh, which is the, the genesis of this, this format. Uh, so Bishop Doug has a... Okay, he, he's an African preacher. So you know you have to excuse African preachers because they're very earthy. So he says that... Um, there are two things he says. He says, number one... Uh, the best milk for a baby is the mother's milk. Right? So he said the best word for a church is their pastor's word. So it's like, I, like when God gave me milk for my baby, I didn't go looking for other mothers to feed the baby. All right, some of you will get that tomorrow. But the other one he gives is he says, <laughs> okay, babe, you're sure you want me to say this? Okay, Bishop Doug said it. I didn't say it. <laughs> so... <laughs> So don't quote me, this is Bishop Doug. Don't, don't put credit on me, say Bishop Doug says. So he says that um, when a man has a low sperm count, it's like 40 million sperm uh, per ejaculation. All right, some of you are a little young, you can close your ears. And, and he says when it's high, when it's a normal, it's much higher. It's 250 million. Wow, you're one in 250 million. <laughs> <laughs> So, so anyway, 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 that's not where I was going, that's not where I was going. I mean, you're serious, you're serious people. But he, here's what he says. He says, when you have a low sperm count, the only chance that you have for conception is you just have to do the act many times. So he says, many times the reason churches don't conceive and grow is because the pastor doesn't teach enough. So people don't receive God's word enough for it to conceive Okay, I can see some people are getting it. A few guys from Kampala. Kampala guys are usually chap chap. Oh, it's life way. It's life way. <laughs> so it's like you have to receive the word enough for it to bear, for, for it to bear fruit. And actually, honestly, when I listened to that message, I, I, I actually felt condemned and rebuked because I said, yes, I haven't taught God's word enough. Um, and so this is sort of like the understanding. When you see the word of God taught, then you see change. I think that's what I've seen in scripture, that people, people need God's word. Just like children need milk, uh, people need God's word. And so I, I, I seek as I do this, I just I believe, even, even in, in, you know, you, you see that the church, the apostle, they are devoted to the apostles' teaching. There's just something powerful when God's teachers teach the word. So, um, so babe, you see, I've, I've done it, and people are serious. Yeah. <laughs> Bishop Doug. <laughs> it was Bishop Doug. So anyway. Hopefully that's woken up somebody who was asleep. Uh, so we want to talk about uh, teaching and healing, all right? And these are the last two I'm going to talk about. And again, these are the rhythms that we've been learning that are just, I, I think for me, I've just been looking in the Word and it's blowing my mind. Just to see the importance of these things. And I think some of them, I knew them, but I don't think I was taught them. And like I said, the people who taught me were not running global movements of kingdom, uh, global kingdom movements of churches. And so when they taught me about teaching, they didn't tell me what teaching really does. When they taught me about the importance of prayer, let me tell you something. You cannot run 40,000 churches. You cannot lead 40,000 churches if you're not a praying movement. 
You look at any global movement of churches and you will find that prayer is at the center. You can't. Now, again, I was not taught that. Uh, you cannot have a growing movement without evangelism at the center. Uh, you can't. I mean, Bishop Adeboe, that humble man I was talking about, Christmas Day, he always, he always does a, 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 a crusade. <laughs> like, that's how he celebrates events. When it's his birthday, he goes and preaches. Like, like isn't that insane? Some of you look for cake and party. Him, he goes to preach in a town. And it's right now, for his 80th birthday, the campaign is 80 million for the bishop. So they're, they're doing a campaign to bring 80 million people to Christ for their bishop's birthday in March. Like, what? There are churches that think of which card do we buy for our bishop. They're like, let's give him a gift worthy of a man of God. I mean, no wonder the church is growing. Like, who thinks about 80 million souls? Like, that's insane. Uh, so, so that's some of these things we're talking about. Uh, uh, the, the visitation. I mean, it's like movements do that. It's just a thing. Like, I, I didn't understand it, but now I see it. Uh, so I think as, as we're teaching these things, I'm teaching them with a renewed passion, with a renewed urgency, because I'm realizing if we're going to be who God is calling us to be, we have to be these things. Uh, they can't just be things we talk about. So teaching. I'm going to talk, talk about teaching today, and I'm going to talk, mention healing in the process. But I want to talk about the, the, the principle of spiritual transfer. That's, that's the thing. You know, because I didn't learn to teach through going to a seminary. I didn't even do a preaching class. I basically served under Bishop Oscar. And as I served under him, uh, he was such a great teacher. I loved his teaching. And then I started doing an internship under him. And then one day he told me, Moravi, next month you're preaching from the book of Jonah. And you're teaching the whole congregation. And I was this 20, I think I was 22. And I was doing a series, I mean, some of you right now in your 40s and 50s, you die if you're told to preach in church. 22, I stood up in front of Nairobi Chapel. And Nairobi Chapel was a church with theologians. And I mean, it was just like, it was so intimidating. My wife can tell you, I bit my nails until they bled. Like, I would call Bishop Oscar on a Saturday to say, I can't come. And the first time he told me, if, if you don't come, there'll be no sermon. So you better come. So I stayed up the whole night, and I showed up shaking. And then the next Saturday night, I called him to say, I can't come. He didn't pick up his phone. So I showed up in here. And I preached. And that's how I learned how to preach, through this great man. I mean, just teaching me how to do it. And you know, it's interesting. The funny thing is, as much as I didn't enjoy the experience, many people came and told me, you preach just like your pastor. It was such a great compliment. And the funny thing is I still get that compliment today. There's still places I go to and people say, wow, you preach just like Bishop Oscar. Have you met a guy called Oscar Muriel? Uh, that's, he, you preach just like him. And you know, it's interesting because for me, it's just an understanding. Like I say, an evolution. By the way, you're going to hear a bit of noise from the wind. Uh, the reason is because that's why they keep the flaps closed. But it's okay. I'd rather have the noise than people asleep. Amen. So, so, so I used to think that teaching or preaching was about passing information and knowledge. Isn't that what we are taught? Like, I want my people to know. When they know, the truth will set them free. So I thought that preaching is about, and teaching is about passing you information, passing you knowledge. But in, an, in recent times, as I've learned, as I've listened to what Bishop Doug uh, teaches, and try to examine why is it having the impact it's having. As I've looked at Apostle Mukisa and said, why is he having the impact? He's, it's not like he's teaching complex things, but there's something happening. The more frequently he's teaching his people, what is happening? And I began to understand there's much more than knowledge and information. When you teach your people, it's not just information you're passing. Let me tell you, and I'm going to start by giving you some scriptures just to show you what I'm talking about. John chapter 6, verse 63. John 6, 63. It says, the Spirit gives life... Let's read it together. The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. Wow. This is Jesus talking to his disciples. Huh? And he's like, listen, there's something that happens. The flesh gives birth to flesh. So human beings, we're flesh, give birth to flesh. But Spirit gives birth to Spirit. Then he says something about his words. He says, my words are Spirit and life. So he's basically saying, when I teach you, it's not knowledge you're getting. You're getting spirit. You're getting life. There's a transfer, a spiritual transfer happening when you're listening to Jesus. That's what he's saying. He's saying, listen, my words are spirit and life. Let's, speak, let's look in the Old Testament. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 2. 
it says, this is a prophet now speaking. He had a vision from God. And he says, then the spirit entered me when he spoke to me and he set me on my feet and I heard him who spoke to me. So, 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 so he's basically saying, he, he's having this vision and he says, when, he, he started, when God started, he's been seeing God. He's been seeing a vision of God. Then God speaks and the spirit enters him. Spiritual transfer. Through the word, something enters into him. There's a spiritual transfer. So there's something that's going on. Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10, verse 44. This is Peter. He goes to the home of Cornelius. And Peter is like, these guys are not Jews. I'm not even supposed to be in their house. I'm not even, I mean, it's not even allowed. If my people saw me, they'd be so horrified. And then he begins to teach them because God has told him, you have to teach them. So he's like, I'm teaching, but I'm not even sure what's happening. And then verse 44, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. Spiritual transfer. Peter couldn't argue with that because he said, look, the Holy Spirit came on them just the same way that he comes on Jews. So God is doing something. I spoke to these guys who are not supposed to get the spiritual transfer. Boom. The same thing happened. You know, it's very interesting because these words, and I'm going to come back to what I mean by spiritual transfer, but I'm hoping you can see it through scripture. Matthew chapter 10, verse 41, and I shared this scripture, uh, both at family night and I shared it uh, I preached here on Sunday, and I've shared the same word. Matthew 10, 41 talks about receiving the word. It talks about how you receive the word, how you posture yourself for the word. It says, whoever re- welcomes a prophet as a prophet receives a prophet's reward. You guys know this scripture, isn't it? And whoever receives or welcomes a, work, a righteous person as a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. So what is it saying? It's saying there's a way that you can listen to the same message, and one person gets a transfer and one doesn't. And it has to do with receptivity. So two guys listening to the pastor preach, one receives him as a good pastor. It's like, oh, wow, those are good words. I like it. This is awesome. But, I mean, I really like Pastor Jemo. I mean, that, those are good words. And guess what happens? He gets a good man's award or reward. What's a good man's reward? A good feeling. He's like, he goes home, I'm inspired. I like that someone. Man, this was awesome. I love the gathering. <laughs> That's what he got. That's his reward. But there's somebody else who came to church and listen to the pastor and say, that is God speaking to me. That is his prophet. And he aligned himself to that word. And he didn't listen to it as a man speaking. He listened to him as God himself speaking. And he obeyed that word. Guess what he got? He got a prophet's reward. So, so, so I, gave, I gave an example when I was at Hill City. Because there was a video that played of Pastor Victor and Zeddy. I don't know if you guys got to see that video. And, 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 and uh, they, they were sharing how at the gathering in November... I talked about the fact that God has said he's getting us out of debt. And I said, hey guys, we all give towards Free the Future. That's the first time I ever spoke about Free the Future. And they talked about how they decided, they had a conversation right after and said, we're giving this gift. The three money practices for us as a couple, we save money together and we invest together. Basically, we save uh, every shilling that we have in one account. Our second money practice is that uh, we faithfully tithe. And when it comes to tithing, we don't tithe because uh, we have the money. But we tithe because, you know, that's a principle that works in the kingdom of God. And a couple of years ago, we sat down and asked ourselves, we know we cannot challenge God with what it comes to giving. And giving is a principle of life. So we decided that every two years we're going to be increasing our tithing by 10%. And as we speak today, we are at 30% where we faithfully tithe. Every month, 30%. And we are left with uh, 70, which we are grateful to God. We have practiced the fast fruit uh, giving in our marriage in such a special way. To us, is special and dear. Because I remember during the gathering last year, uh, Pastor M said that uh, we are a place where we need to free the future of our mother campus, which is Hill City. And he gave us the challenge of giving our one month January salary. Uh, when Pastor M said that, uh, and he gave me the figure, it was actually everything that we had. <laughs> and I remember looking at him, and the first question I ask is, so uh, how are we paying school fees? Uh, so 
how are we going to 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 pay for this loan that we have so how are we so mine was just question after question after question of how we are going to pay and i remember the answer he gave me he told me god is going to provide so immediately after i get uh, someone sent me some photos of very nice houses and what they told me is kindly choose choose a house that you want to live in i think 3 days later the same person texts me again please tell me that you have decided on a house <laughs> i would like to move you into one of these houses i showed him again and every other time i kept showing him he's like this is a joke so what i decided is let me look for this person sit down with them so that i don't assume they've sent me a message but you know sometimes kids play with the phone by the way, to be honest that's what i was thinking maybe the child was with the phone and they were sending messages so i looked for this person and i went and sat down with her and i told them uh, you sent me something and i don't understand where it's coming from or are you selling houses and you're not telling me they said no i would like to get you a house i want you to move from where you are into a a house a good house because where we live we live in our own uh, compound but we've not built a permanent house all he could say is mimi is it jokes sipendi remember god telling uh, pastor victor uh, if you deny this person to do whatever it is that i have told them to do you're denying them a blessing and i remember during the meeting i sat down with them and i asked them okay fine if this is what you hear god telling you to do i want you to narrate to us your encounter with god and the person sat down and explained how they felt god lead them to come to us to have the conversation with my wife because she felt she's most comfortable to to bring the uh, info to her and and they got to a place where they said if you do not allow us to do this for you you are blocking the blessings of god into our lives and that is why we said okay fine because we live at our own place instead of moving us why don't we start the journey that we have always dreamed to have as a couple and that is to build our home and as we speak here today we are done with the foundation we are done with the walling and we have gotten to a place where we are about to put our slab and continue on uh with the house so we are grateful to god to having gone in ourselves to a place despite of the fear that we had we became faithful we became diligent and god provided god has provided that was november now in november i was not giving the word so that people can start giving the gift i was giving the word to prepare the leaders to give their pledge So that when I come to the church I can say we've raised this much already. But the guy didn't receive the word that way. He was like this is God speaking. He told his wife this is we're doing it now. Now fast forward you wait until January. The guy is like no 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 we're doing it now. The wife told him we don't have money. He's like God will provide. We're doing it now. And they did it. Did you guys see the difference between the house they were living in and the house they're building? Did you note the the dif- did you note the fact that there's a before and an after? and that before was november 21st did you know the acceleration that cannot be explained by human words that no eye has seen no ear has heard no mind can imagine can you nobody could have imagined where they would be yesterday they gave us a father testimony they said when the video played in church somebody came up to ch- to them and said i want to be part of this blessing so i'm doing all the curtains for your house Then Pastor, Pastor Victor and Zedi I'm giving you a testimony I keep giving you a testimony I mean there they are I love you guys that's why I give you a story so much <laughs> And then somebody else came and said I need to see you and they're like I, they, they thought it was a person looking for prayer you know how people look for the pastor after church and the person said I've been sent to take your measurements because I've been told to measure for you 10 10 different suits of clothes Like like what Somebody say acceleration new clothes for new house why are you why are you walking into the new house with old clothes 
<laughs> new wine skins for the new wine. <laughs> so, so, so listen, there are people in November 21st who listened to the word and said, I like Pastor M. He's my boy. In fact, I felt so inspired. I couldn't even sleep that night. So inspiring. <laughs> and then there are people who say, that is God's word. That is God's prophet. I'm going to do what it says. And they receive the prophet's reward. So, so what I'm trying to say is the word is not just a transfer of information. There is a spiritual transfer. So teaching, that's why this thing is so important for us. In a movement, we must all become teachers. Because all of us are disciples. So all of us are going to learn how to teach God's word. Because why? Because that's how you pass on spiritual transfer. So let me talk a bit about how it works. I mean, and some of this is, is bringing old knowledge and connecting new knowledge. What I'm trying to do is connect where we've come from to where we're going and bring those things together. So 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, you all know it. It says, and the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. We all know that scripture. Now, Paul is saying something. He's saying, Timothy, you and I have worked together. We've hung out. We've become friends. You've had me teach over the years. You've taken notes. You've even memorized some of the things I taught. I mean, you can imagine these guys are going to town after town and Paul is preaching the same messages over and over. So by the time they're done, it's like, by the way, this happened to me with Pastor Oscar, literally. Like I had him preach so many times, I could preach some of his sermons word for word, almost without notes. It's like, you know my sermons. So he's saying, look, you've seen what I taught and you've seen how I teach. Now do that. Do exactly what you saw. Teach those guys the way you saw me teach. And then teach them to teach others. And teach those ones to teach others. Now, why would he say that? I mean, why wouldn't he say to, somebody, to Timothy, now, I want you as a pastor, pray and discern God's will for your people. Listen to their situation. Try and understand where they're coming from. Then look in the scriptures and teach. That sounds very logical. That's what I would have thought a few <laughs> months ago. I'd have said, look, look, Pastor, pastor Jemo, figure out where Hill City guys are because it's different from where downtown guys are. And let's just, let's, 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 let's discern where our people are. Then, then let's go back to scripture and figure out what God could be saying to our people. But he's not saying that. He's not saying that. It almost seems like he's dictating to Timothy what to preach, isn't it? I mean, it's like he's telling Timothy what, to, is, he dicta is he just telling him what, is he just dictating? I don't think so. I think that Paul understands that teaching is more than just passing information and knowledge. He understands that there's something that he has passed on to Timothy. There's been a spiritual transfer, and he understands that Timothy needs to take that spiritual transfer and pass it on to the rest of the family. That there's something powerful that will happen when he does what he saw Paul do and passes it on to the rest. The spirit that is in me, that I received from Jesus, I, am, I have transferred to you, you will transfer to the next person. There is a spiritual transfer. By the way, get it in your head, guys. When you're listening to a sermon on Sunday, that you, are in the, you have an opportunity for a spiritual transfer. That's what God is giving you, an opportunity. The words he's giving you are spirit and life, not knowledge. You know, some of us went to school and we took lots of notes, which we proceeded to burn after exams because we're just notes, we memorized them for exams. They didn't really bring any life to us. They just brought confusion and stress. But that's not what a sermon is. God doesn't want you to have a notebook full of sermons. He wants you to have life and he wants a spirit in you. That's the opportunity we have. And when you pass it on to reliable people, huh, the things that you've heard me say, Paul is saying, the things you've heard, pass them on. And, they, and what you're doing, you're passing on the family anointing. You're passing on the movement anointing. Any blessing that is on this house, you're passing it on to your people. And you're, causing, you're, you're stopping from causing confusion because there's a family blessing that God has given the family. When the family starts getting, and this is what happens with many Christians, they start getting confused because they're listening to so many voices. They're listening to Steve Fartick out in Elevation Church. They're listening to Bishop so-and-so out in Ghana. They're listening to another bishop from Canada and Bethel Church. And they're listening to all these streams of knowledge. But what they're getting is knowledge. They're not getting spiritual transfer because spiritual transfer is about inheritance. It is. Spiritual transfer is about what has God blessed your house with that is being passed on to the next generation. That's how the word works. Let me tell you what, I went to seminary for four years. Nobody taught me this stuff. Nobody taught me this. And so when I listen to Bishop Adeboye teaching, I listen to him make proclamations, and I understand there's a word God has given for that church. There's a prophet he has put in that church. And this word, if that church takes it and activates it, it will give birth. 
And they are going to become great because the spirit that is in that man will be upon them. And the spirit that is in that house will be upon them. And they will, they will make disciples. That's their destiny. And this is when you begin to understand what the word of God does. So no wonder Paul says to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 11, and I've used these verses before, he says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. He's not even there. He's in another, he's in an uptown. He, actually, he's writing this by letter. He's not telling them, by the way, just follow the example of whichever teacher is in town right now teaching on Sunday. He's saying, follow my example. There is an anointing that God has given me for the Gentiles and you're those people. And if you follow this anointing, God's going to do powerful things. So follow my example because I'm following the example of Jesus. Of course, there's a caveat there. Once I stop following the example of Jesus, I stop following my example. Because you're not following a man. You're following the anointing of God. <laughs> That's what you're following. So he says, follow me as I follow Christ. So follow me, yes, but the caveat is the minute I divert, the minute I start teaching you things that are not Christ, don't follow me. I love that. And later in the chapter, he says, uh, if you remember that whenever we do communion, we talk about this thing. He says, for I receive from the Lord. You remember that verse? For I receive from the Lord what I also passed on to you. I like that. He's like, I'm not just telling you my words. I'm also following. There's an anointing I'm passing on. And I'm passing it on to you as I received it. So he's like, Let's, so you pass on because I'm also passing on. Uh, the, the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. I love that. I love that about Paul. He's, he's like, come on, there's an anointing that I'm passing on. So this is a spiritual, the, trans, the, 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 the principle of spiritual transfer. There's a powerful transaction that takes place when you receive the word of your spiritual authority. There's a, a transfer of spirit. Yes, there's knowledge as well. But it's more than knowledge. When I taught you today, and I'm teaching you so much this week, I know you're not going to remember everything I'm going to tell you. But that's not even useful. It's not even the thing I'm looking for. I'm not looking for you to be able to recite everything I've taught you. I'm looking for you to catch the spirit of what God is doing in this house. That's what I'm looking for. If you catch the spirit, you don't even need anything. Because the spirit will remind you of the things that you learned. That's, what Jesus, that's why Jesus said, look, when the Holy Spirit comes, he'll remind you of everything I've taught you. Yeah, you just need to catch the spirit. Once you catch the Spirit, boom, wait for Pentecost. God does what He wants to do. So, 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 so Timothy, I love the fact that, listen, he's, he's, he's listening to the Apostle Paul. He's not listening, Paul is not saying, this. remember the sermon you had me teach? Teach that one to reliable men. He doesn't say that. He's like, the things you've had, Timothy has listened to Paul over and over, over years. He's listened to his messages over and over. He's, had, he's, he's helped Paul teach. He's helped Paul in, in, in doing ministry. Well, maybe he's even the one selling booklets as, at the back. He's setting up the chairs. He's the guy who's his assistant as they're going around preaching. He's the guy who's there. In fact, the funny thing about Timothy, I didn't even realize this until I started doing my research. Paul quotes Timothy six times as a co-author of a book. Like, it's crazy. Like, go, go, just look in your Bible, 2 Corinthians. The beginning of 2 Corinthians. Look at the beginning of Philippians. Paul, apostle of Christ Jesus, and Timothy. Like, it's crazy. It's like this guy actually even co-wrote the Bible with Paul. We don't even think about that. Colossians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, Philemon. I mean, the guy is so in Paul's teaching that he's even teaching Paul's teaching with Paul. Like, they're together. It's like he gets what this, he's, he's like, so, listen, in fact, he says at one point, when you see Timothy, you've seen me. <laughs> imitate me. When he says imitate me, then he says, I'm sending Timothy to you. Who will remind you of my ways? <laughs> Isn't that powerful? It's like this guy has absorbed so much what I have, the anointing that I have. When you're with him, you will get it. That's, that's what Jesus... So, so, so where am I going with this? Let me start bringing it together. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15. 1 Corinthians 4, 15 to 17. It says, For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ... Yet you do not have many fathers, for in Christ Jesus are begotten you through the gospel. That's Paul. He says, therefore I urge you, imitate me. And then he says in verse 17, and that's the one I just said, for this reason I've sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. So Paul's like, all the churches I teach, I teach them the same thing. And Timothy is with me. So when you see Timothy, you will see an embodiment of what I'm teaching. So you can trust his word because he knows the word God gave me. Spiritual transfer has already happened with this man called Timothy. So, so, so these guys, he's saying you have many instructors. 
You have many lecturers. You have many guys on YouTube you're listening to. But listen, very few spiritual fathers. So, so don't get confused. Follow me. Imitate. Don't imitate those guys because they're not your father. Imitate me. And it sounds like a very arrogant thing to say until you understand that Paul understands the spiritual, the, 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 this spiritual transfer principle. He understands that when you listen to many voices, you get confused. Many instructors, you don't in, when you start imitating many instructors, some of them are telling you fast. Others of them are telling you cast demons. Other, you start becoming a confused Christian. In fact, you, what happens is you get spiritual constipation. You have, too many con, you have too many foods coming in from too many rich sources. And you just end up standing there. You're stuck with indigestion. And it's like, no, 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 imitate me. You know, fathers are the ones who live an inheritance. And Paul is like, I'm your spiritual father, guys. If you don't have many fathers, I'm your spiritual father. You imitate me. Don't get it twisted. <laughs> These other instructors are not your father. I mean, this is, a, this is the Apostle Paul. And he's talking to the churches and saying, you, there are many, and I'm sure there are many, you, you, you'd think he's the only one teaching. There are many other people teaching in his time. And he's like, look, I'm the one who begot you in Christ Jesus. So listen to me and imitate me. Now, we've been going through some coaching as a pastoral team. Uh, at one point, I felt this thing we're going through, Worship Harvest Church, have, they're, they're like a year ahead of us in this reformation, in this transformation. And so I say to Apostle Mo, Apostle Moses, I want you to coach us. I want you to actually meet with our pastoral team twice a month online, and we'll get all our pastors to come in, and you get your pastors, and you just help walk with us. And it's been a fantastic thing. By the way, I've learned that when you... <laughs> Like I told you, originality is overrated. It is. This pride of let me find my own way is just foolishness. You waste your whole life trying to create your own path. Look for somebody who's doing what you're doing, what you want to do, and is doing it better than you and ahead of you. Follow them. Just learn from them. And you'll find yourself accelerating. This, by the way, is a principle for life. Yeah? If you're single and you want to get married, look for a girl who is your, who's like you and is married. Thank you. It's only a man who said I'm preaching good. <laughs> if your marriage is not doing well, look for a couple whose marriage is doing well and imitate them. Get into their space. Hang out with them. Those friends you hang out with who are all complaining about how bad their marriages are, that is how you will end up. You become who you follow. So they're all just nagging and saying, oh, my husband is horrible. Oh, I hate how he comes home late. His teeth are always smelling. Guess what? Even you start seeing your husband the same way. So ha stop hanging out with those people. Look for the people who are doing better and hang out with them. Like I said, this is a life principle. If your business is doing badly, hang out with the people whose business is doing well. I didn't used to know this because I'm such a competitive person. My wife taught me this. When we ran a business, she would even go to the competition and just say help. Like, who does that? But you know, she's so harmless. She just goes, oh, just help me. You just see the competition just coming to fix our computers. And you're like, in fact, I remember one day walking into the room and I'm like, what's that guy doing here? I'm so horrified. She's like, he's helping us. And sure enough, the guy was not there to steal secrets. He was actually there to help us. She followed. And guess what? In fact, that guy even started giving us extra business when he had too much business. I'm so glad I wasn't running the company. If it was me, that guy would never have come within a mile. <laughs> of my computer because I didn't understand this spiritual principle of imitating. So, so anyway, Apostle Moore taught us a very powerful thing and some of you who are in that call, you remember him saying this. He said, you don't get to choose whom you honor. Ooh. Remember that? Yes. And I didn't even know this principle when he said it. But he said, you didn't choose which family you were born in and that's which parents you will honor. Some of you grew up in a family where the neighbor's parents were more parents than your parents. And you admire their parents more than you admire your parents. In fact, your parents were just never there. They're not a good example. You'd rather you were born in that family. But guess what? You are not born in that family. Those are not the parents. And if you honor those parents, the blessing of anointing, the, the anointing will not come through them. That parent whom you despise, that horrible parent, is the one God puts you in their home. You don't choose who you honor. You honor your father regardless. Regardless. Yes, he hurt you. Yes, he was horrible. Yes, he insulted. Yes, he abused. Whatever. He's the father God gave you. He's the only one. You honor him. That's a spiritual principle. You don't get to choose which nation that you are born in. And that's where you pay taxes. I mean, I can decide, man, I hate Kenyan politics. I just don't like these guys and the mess they're creating. 
I love UG, man. I mean, UG's got their act together. I mean, I love UG. Why can't I just pay my taxes to URA? I mean, from today, I'm just getting a form from their website and filling out, and I'm just... Kenya Revenue Authority will be on me like a problem. <laughs> you don't get to choose where you're born, isn't it? You pay the taxes where they're due. But the other thing he said that was really stunning is he said, and strangely enough, you don't even get to choose the church that you belong to. And that's your spiritual leaders. You don't get to choose. Yes, you thought you chose. You looked around until you found a church where you felt you fit. But if you actually examine closely, you will see the hand of the Spirit was there in your choice. God planted you in the church he planted you in. There are other churches between where your church is right now, your, your, your Mavuno branch, and your house. And you passed all those and came to that church you're in. So you don't get to choose the, the church you're part of. You don't get to choose your spiritual authority. You don't get to choose who you honor. You honor because you give honor where it's due. And Paul is saying, if you want to catch the anointing of your spiritual parents, then you have to imitate them. So this is all connecting, by the way, with what I'm, I was saying earlier about teaching. Because the words that they teach you are spirit and truth and life. So when I teach, I can say this unashamedly. My words that God has given me are spirit and life to you because this is your church. So, so but I used to be so, I just didn't know this. And unfortunately, when a father doesn't know the power he has, he can hurt children or he can leave them without inheritance. He can leave them deprived. When a father doesn't know if he tells his son, I'm proud of you, son, that this man will grow up secure, he can withhold that word. Maybe feeling unqualified. Maybe not even understanding his son needs that word. And there are many fathers, because they don't understand the power of their words, they go out without sharing those words, and they leave their children struggling. And I think for many years I was that father. I didn't understand that my words are spirit and truth. And so I want to say as your spiritual father, I bless you. I do. I do. And the words I give you, they are spirit and truth. And they will build you up. They will. Because they are God's word to you. Because I am your father. Can I say that? I am. And I take my confidence from the book where Paul himself says, you don't have many, you have many instructors. You don't have many fathers. And Paul is bold enough and is modeling that I need to be bold to take that position in your life. <laughs> when you listen to the words that I give you, the Spirit will enter into you as you meditate on those words. It's the same as Ezekiel, that the Holy Spirit entered as he listened to the word. It's just the truth. The Holy Spirit will come upon you just like it did when Paul, when Peter talked to the Cornelius and those Romans. It came into them as the word came. I really believe this as well to be true. And so the anointing of your church will become your anointing when you receive the message of the house as the word of God to you. Can I say that again? Yes. The anointing of the house will become your anointing when you receive the message given in your church as God's word to you. When you hear the pastor preaching on a Sunday and you take that word and you run with it. You don't wait for next Sunday to come back and fill your notebook. You're like, what am I taking? What is God saying to me? You're leaning forward every day. You're coming early. You're engaging because you want to hear God's word, spirit and truth, spirit and, and life being deposited into you. And this anointing will happen to you as you listen to this word. So I want you to actually, I want to encourage you to listen to my messages. Listen to them. Uh, I, I got challenged by some guys from Mashariki because they told me, you know, Pasi, uh, YouTube is very expensive. You need a podcast. So I want to announce, and this is the first time I'm announcing, by the way, that I actually have a podcast. So, so you can actually go on, you can go to Spotify, search for Moredi Wanjao, and then look for, uh, there, there are several, you'll see many Moredi Wanjaos, but look for Pastor M under those Moredi Wanjaos in Spotify, Apple Podcasts. And you'll find many messages. Uh, we've, the team tried to put as many of my messages as they could find there, and they're still uploading them. Listen to them. Listen to them. Don't listen once. Listen again. There are messages on relationships. There are messages on money. And they are God's word to his church. And when you hear a message, don't listen to it in, on Sunday only. Listen to it again during the week. I remember we went to a church uh, with some of my pastors here. And we had such a... a, a in, we, I mean, that church was on fire. They were so on fire. They just made us... We left like this. We were going to a church and they just looked like this. Like we're shaken being around those guys. And I remember we asked them, guys, what is this? And one of the guys... I mean, they told us many things, obviously. But one of the things they told us is, in the church, all of them listen to the, the, sermon, the, the pastor's sermon more than three times a week. In fact, I remember one person said he listened seven times. At that point, I was like, you guys are fanatics. Uh, <laughs> last scene, I'm not... But then, as, with time, I came to understand spirit, life. 
they've understood there's a spiritual transfer. And he told me, you know, in the, on, on the, in the Matatu, the, the, the bus on my way to work, I have my headphones. I'm listening to the Sunday message over. And then when I'm at work, I've got a lunch time. I sit down with my lunch sometimes, and I just listen to that message. Sometimes even as I'm doing some work, I'm listening to that message. On my way home in the commute, I've got another chance to listen. And he says, every time you listen, something's happening in your spirit. And those guys love their church. They are they're, they're such passionate events. There's just something that's list, lifted up in their lives. I mean, those guys are on fire for Jesus. And I realized they've understood spiritual transfer. This is why teaching is so important, guys. Hey, I know you didn't expect me to talk about this, but that's been my biggest revelation, that teaching is not passing on of knowledge. It is passing on spiritual transfer. That's what we're doing. And somebody might ask the question, but Pastor I'm hold on a minute. Isn't this cloning? Aren't we cloning people? Aren't, we making, aren't you making people think like you as opposed to helping, making them think for themselves? And I think that's a great question. In fact, the reason I think it's such a great question is that's exactly the same question I would have asked myself a little while back. Aren't you removing the freedom for people to think for themselves? Aren't you making them think like you? But looking at my life and then looking through Scripture, I've come to see that's not what we're talking about. It's a completely different ballgame. Cloning is producing mindless versions of yourself. That's what cloning is. But that's not what we're talking about. Let me illustrate. When a doctor is being trained. By the way, do you have any doctors in the house? Anybody in medical field? All right. Okay, we've got a few. Awesome. When you've got a doctor, and a doctor is going through medical school, uh, they want to maybe be a surgeon. The first thing you do in a surgery is you observe. You go with somebody who's a, a teacher, somebody who's a professor, somebody who's got many years of experience, and you sit there. That's why you find, okay, I know you guys have never been in an operation room, but you've watched those series where everybody's dressed in green, and they're all, and past people are, so you stand there, you don't even get to ch a, a chance to be the one who's passing the forceps to the doctor. You have not qualified yet. You stand there taking notes. And you stand there long enough until you begin to understand what's happening. Then you become the assistant. You move up to the, a little closer, and you start being the one to hand off. Hand me the, uh-huh, hand me the screwdriver, whatever it is, hand me, you know. So you're the guy who hands the things over. And then eventually, you get to be at the place where you can even hold as the guy is doing it. And maybe you're the one holding the clumps when the guy is doing the stitching. The whole time, you're learning. You're watching carefully what this guy is doing. You're listening to all the instructions he's giving. And then finally, as you go through this process, you now get a chance to be the one who's in charge of the operation. But guess what happens when, that day when you're in charge? You do exactly what your teacher did. Because it's a life at stake. You're not messing around because this is not a car. This is not a place of, oops, let's bring me another one. Let's try <laughs> It's like one mess and you've killed somebody. So you do exactly, very tenderly and gingerly. And maybe at some point you'll make a little mistake, but it's like, you know what? Uh, you're learning. And your, your teacher is there to kind of help you and say, uh-uh, do it this way. And finally, you start becoming good. And you start doing it by yourself. And eventually you get so good that you even start improvising. There's something you're even adding that your teacher didn't show you, but it's like, I, I, found, a, I found a way to do it that is actually even a little better. But it took you a long time to get there. Now, let me ask you a question. Has that professor just produced a mindless clone of herself? No. What she has done is raise up a skilled surgeon. That's what she's done. That girl would never have been a skilled surgeon by <laughs> originality. <laughs> I want to do an original surgery. <laughs> just give me a heart patient. Me have ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God, the patients will be like, no, don't take me out of here. You know, it's like, this guy will kill me. You don't experiment if you're in a skilled profession. You follow. And it's true in any field that requires any, any kind of expertise. Whether you're talking about a maestro with a violin, you follow and you watch and you pass on what, it's, you just do exactly what you're being taught. If you're talking about a fighter jet pilot, I mean, that guy will spend years just following the instructions and doing what he's taught to do. You're talking about an Olympic uh, a gymnast. I mean, they have to, it's like you have to follow the field, the way it's been taught, and, and, and follow your leader and, and do what they're doing. And eventually, you'll be able to do it for yourself. That's the way it is. There's a transfer that happens. But it doesn't come from you being, it comes from you just doing what you see the person doing. This is what's happening. And that's why I feel like teaching and passing on and saying, pass on what you've seen me pass on. That's not passing on a mindless clone. It's not raising a mindless clone. It's teaching, a, it's raising a, a skilled instructor in God's word. 
That's what that is. There's an, a great story of, of spiritual transfer in the scripture. And this story is one of those funny stories. If you read the Bible, you know sometimes we read the Bible like holy spiritual people. And we miss the humor, we miss the wonder of it. There's this great story of Elijah and Elisha when they took their last walk together. And I don't know if you've ever read that story. Because basically what happens is Elijah and Elisha, Elijah has the story, he gets a picture from heaven, he has a download, and he's like, this is your last day on earth, man. So he, he walks with Elisha, and they're walking uh, to, he's walking to leave. He, knows, he doesn't know how he's going to go, but he knows he's going. And so he gets to the place where he, they meet several schools of prophets. And the schools of prophets, because they're also prophets, they also have download. And they know. They know that this guy is going to die. <laughs> so they tell him something. They tell him, they tell Elijah, by the way, Elisha, do you know that your master is going to go away? This is his last day. The Lord is about to take your master from you. And it's so funny because the same conversation is repeated in two conversations. I think one was Bethel and the other one was Jericho. There were schools of prophets in both those places. So what's funny is the words are exactly the same. It's like the prophets just have the same conversation. So the first thing is, do you know the Lord is about to take your master away from you? They are displaying their prophetic knowledge. And Elijah says, I know. So what? That's what he says. Yes, I know, Elijah said. In fact, he said, yes, I know, Elijah said. So be quiet. You're like, hey, testy, testy. This guy is touchy today. But actually, you know, in fact, what he's saying is, so what? Shut up. It's like, you guys shut up. And even though, and then after that, in each case, Elijah tells him, please stay behind. Let me leave you. In fact, this is a good school of prophets. I think you'd fit in here. I can see they have an extra room. <laughs> Elijah says, as surely as the Lord lives and you live, I will not leave you. I mean, it's like, it's repeated twice. And it's like, they're just showing you, Elijah is just like, he's holding on like a dog to a bone. And then eventually you get to see why he's so insistent. Because they cross the Jordan, there's this thing where Elijah uh, puts his cloak and the thing parts, the water parts, like Moses. They walk across and then they get to the other side and then uh, Elijah turns to him. In fact, 2 Kings 2.9, just put that verse up. He turns to him and he asks him a question. Elijah asks him, uh, and so it was when they had crossed over that Elijah said to Elisha, Ask, what may I do for you before I'm taken away from you? And Elisha said, Please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. Let me tell you, Elisha understood spiritual transfer. He's like, you guys, you've decided Elijah is going and you're saying goodbye. I'm not saying goodbye. There is a portion for me. In fact, I want double portion. I am going to hang on to this guy. I want every word he has for me. I'm going to take it and I'm going to wait and he's not going without blessing me. I want that double portion. It was such a po powerful thing because he held on when everybody else was falling off. He pushed in. He, he pushed in when everybody else was, was pulling out. He held on. And after that, guess what happens? Elisha becomes the greatest prophet Israel has ever seen. He literally becomes greater than his master because of that spiritual transfer. In fact, he doesn't just get spiritual transfer. He gets double spiritual transfer. In fact, he does things at a wider scale. Have you ever read, read the, the stories of Elisha? His miracles were comical. They were, they, were, they were foolish in terms of just how powerful they are. Some funny small boys, some youth, my youths, they come and start insulting him. Ah, kiparangoto. Well, sorry, that just means <laughs> spiritual language. Bold head, bold head. He just looks at them and bears come out and, and eat them. <laughs> Somebody's axe falls into the river. He just picks up a stick of a piece of wood and throws it in the river, and the axe floats. The axe head floats. It's like who does? I mean, it's like crazy. Nobody has ever like like he's attacked. He's surrounded by a neighboring army. A whole army is sent to capture him. Like first of all, why are they capturing him? Because the guy has he's so he has so much insight. There is nothing they can do with military intelligence that he doesn't know. So when they choose to attack Israel on this side, he tells the king. By the way, tell the king they are coming from there. The next day they try this side, they find they're being waited for. And eventually they get the leakage. It's actually the prophet Elisha. He's telling them, it's like he's in your room. The guy has received so much anointing from Elisha. It's like when they're having their meeting, it's like he's there in the spirit. Oh, he goes and tells the king what's happening. And so they come and attack him and they, they hold him and they're coming to take him down. And what does he do? He just does, and all of them become blind, the whole army. <laughs> then he tells them, hold hands. Then he takes them to the king, the king of Israel. And he puts them in the city. They close the doors. And then their eyes are open and they have been captured. They're in. And then when they say, 
Uh, King says, do I kill them? He's like, no, no, just feed them and release them. He's like, why do you need to kill them? I'm here. <laughs> if you want to understand spiritual authority, read Elisha. That man has authority like nobody else. Apart from Jesus, Elisha is the greatest prophet. I mean, he has power. His dead bones resurrected someone. That's the most funny story. There are Israelites who are burying a guy, and then they see some Moabite raider, raiders. And so because they're afraid of being caught, they throw the body in the grave and they run off. The body touches his bones. Look, the guy wakes up. Like, touches his bones. Like, a guy is dead. In fact, for him to be, have bones, he's been dead for a long time. But his bones are still bringing people to life. Like, what kind of anointing is that? That's called double portion of anointing. He's greater than his leader. And interestingly, in, fa in fact, I didn't know this, but Elijah performed 16 miracles that are recorded. Elisha performed 32. Double. Double. Somebody say double, double. <laughs> yeah. That's what's happening. He understood the principle of spiritual transfer. He was willing to fight for it. So, so, so this thing, is not, we're not talking about cloning here. We're talking about as there's a specificity to anointing. There's something that God has given a house. And when you understand it, you catch hold of that anointing. And it's passed on through the word. Because when the word is taught, there is spiritual transfer. That's what actually is happening. The role of discipleship is not to produce clones, but to pass anointing. To bring a transfer of spiritual authority. That's exactly what happens. And Elisha said, in fact, it's so interesting. Because Elijah said something to Elisha when he asked for a double portion. He was like... Hey, you've asked a hard thing. You've asked for a really difficult thing. Why is that? Because Elijah knew who he was. And he understood what God has done through him. He was like, man, the crazy things that God has used me to do, the power in me has done some really serious things. Like I said the word and there was drought for three years. That's serious anointing I have. Huh? Like that's not easy to transfer. It's like I've controlled weather patterns. I've, 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 I've called fire from heaven. That's a hard thing you're asking for. He understood that this thing this man wanted was not an easy thing to get. And let me just say this. And again, I speak, Paul says, there are some things I say foolishly. Uh, there are some things that he says, and he says, I think I'm being foolish, but let me say it anyway. To catch a, a double portion of the anointing that is on my house, that is on me and Pastor Carol, it's a hard thing. It's a hard thing. It's not an easy thing. And maybe I can say this because you're the leaders of this church that I've spoken in forums across every continent. I have. And some of you have not traveled with me. In fact, most of you haven't. But I've spoken in places where God has used my voice to change the course of churches and course of denominations. I have changed and we have changed the lives of hundreds of thousands of people. There are people whose lives have been transformed because of us that we've never met. There are people who, <laughs> there, there's an entire prison system in Latin America that has used Mizizi and the prisoners have been changed dramatically. A revival happened because of the book Mizizi in Spanish. There are people whose marriages have been changed forever that I've never met. I remember one church in California that Cara and I went and the lady came hugging us and crying. Like, have I told you this story about the lady? That lady who... You, you guys know that story? The lady who had... Her marriage had been changed. She came into the church completely suicidal, messed up had about rooted the Mizizi pro program they were doing, did it. The Lord transformed her completely, healed her of all her depression. She got married to the Mizizi uh, facilitator. They now had three children. Her life was completely transformed. She was weeping when she met us. She says, I've been wanting to meet you. Come to my house. When can you come and stay with us? We would love to bless you. What I'm trying to say, guys, is God has used us greatly. I've spoken before governors and senators in different places in the world. And guys, I'm just beginning. I'm still young. I'm still young. I'm leading a movement of churches that is across nations. I'm not Bishop Adebo here yet, but I believe that God has used me greatly. So to ask for the anointing that is in this house to be your anointing, it's not a small thing. It's not a small thing. But I want to say this. There is no spiritual parent who doesn't want their children to be greater, not to be greater than them. Yeah. There's none. There's no parent I've met who wants their children to be mediocre. Like, I want to be the one who's hot, and I want my kids to be really below me. Every parent desires that their children will exceed them. Everyone. I believe that as Elijah said, you've asked a difficult thing. His heart wished greatly 
that God would hear the prayer of this young man and that this anointing, this transfer would happen. And it happened. And he caught the robe. And after that, he did greater things. And I want to prophesy over you, you will do greater things than anything we've ever done. You will. You will. Children will be named after you in nations you don't even know. <laughs> yeah. God will use you. Many of you are going to impact nations. You will impact nations. You get to heaven and there will be a waiting party. People will have a party because of you. And a retinue of thousands of people who came to Christ because of you and your business. This is your portion in Christ Jesus. This is my desire for you. This is the anointing I believe that God has on this house. We've talked about this anointing before. We've said that this house has an anointing of wealth without sorrow. I speak this over you. That you will not chase after money. You will chase God's kingdom and things of God will follow, the things of the world will follow you. This is your portion because you're part of this house. I speak over you a beautiful marriage. Some of you have struggled in your marriages. It's been hard. But I speak over you. If this is your desire and this is your house, then my goodness, this is the anointing that is on this house. That you will have a better marriage than ours. And let me tell you, that's a hard thing. Because <laughs> we have an amazing, I love my wife like, oh my gosh. I love her 28 years. It's 28 this month. No, next month. Two months, two months. April. But I love her more than I did when we got married, by the way. And we are such good friends. She can tell you, our marriage is in a very, we're sweet. We love each other. We hang out. Let me tell you, it's a hard thing, but that's your portion. In fact, yours will be better than ours by far. Yeah, that's because you're a child of this house. And the anointing is yours. The transfer is yours. It's yours. These are the blessings God has given us. Your children will love God. And they will be missionaries for the kingdom. You will marvel as you see the things that God is using them to do in their generation. Yeah, they will exceed you. <laughs> You'll just be standing there in awe saying, praise God. <laughs> like Jacob, you'll be worshipping on your stick, <laughs> saying, praise God. Look at my children that God has given me. This is your portion in Christ Jesus. Some of you don't even have children, don't have children yet, but you will remember when your children are doing exploits. The pastor prophesied these things over us. This is the house that God brought you into. Remember, you didn't bring yourself, he brought you. So this is your portion. This is your blessing. So, so, so how do we begin to apply this message, guys? How do we begin to, this message of spiritual transform? It's really a message on teaching and understanding teaching. So here are, the, here are a few points for you as we conclude. Number one, listen to your shepherd's voice. Listen to your shepherd's voice. Listen to the teachings of this house. Whether it's me teaching, whether it's Pastor Mike teaching in Kampala, whether it's Pastor Daniel teaching in, da, in, uh, in, in Berlin, listen to your shepherd's voice. And listen, my, the pastors that I lead, they listen to my voice. So when they speak to you, you're hearing my voice in your compass. Listen to it because that's a voice God in this house. That's what he desires for this community. I'd say the same in my family. By the way, if you're a father, your children are blessed when they listen to your word. It's just the way it is. God follows for authority, the structure of authority. So listen to that voice. My wife keeps saying something that's very powerful. She says, wives are blessed when they understand the prophetic voice of their husband. She says, there are many, there are many wives who treat their husbands as good men and they receive a good man's award. She said, when you begin to understand that the Lord has anointed him as a prophet for your house, you will pray for him differently. And you will listen to his voice differently. And you will receive a prophet's reward. <laughs> I hear someone say preach. <laughs> but you know what? It sounds funny. But remember, it's not because the guy is all that. It's because the Lord has set up that authority structure. So, so it's, not, it's not because your husband is a great guy and this one, and this one doesn't have a... It's not about that. It's just the way it is. When you start honoring your, your, your earthly father, he may even be an alcoholic and a drug addict. But when you start honoring him, God's principle, you will live long in the land the life the Lord has given you. It is just there. God's principles are not dependent on the person. They're dependent on you obeying them. So, so listen to the voice of your shepherd. Don't, don't, don't rush to, to listen to so many messages that your podcast is just ringing all the time with different things. I'm not saying it's bad to listen. But I'm saying many times what happens is you're doing things that are just confusing and they're just... They're causing inaction in your life. Because God has given us a very specific word and a very specific calling. But you're listening to so many voices that you're just in the place where you're just going, going around in circles. Doing this one day and doing this the other day. It's time for you to say, listen, there's a, there's a, there's a portion in this house. And so hold on to that word. Uh, like I said, go on to Spotify. <laughs> if, if you don't know, I mean, the beautiful thing about podcast, for those who are still 
which chat should I enjoy because he kept enjoying Mashariki. So which one should I enjoy? Which, which are the guys who don't know podcasts? Downtown. Okay, downtown. So for the guys of downtown, <laughs> podcasts, when you have a podcast app, when you're in Wi-Fi, it downloads the episodes you've chosen to download. So when you're in the Matatu, you don't have to be using your bundles. You just have all the messages you need as they come out. So that's the beauty of, okay, I'm sure it's not downtown guys. Downtown guys are very switched on. But I'm just saying this to understand that, yeah, this is how it works. And so get the, get the podcast up so you always have the messages from the house. Uh, we're also creating one that will have all the family night messages. And so you have a place where you're able to go back and listen to what God has said and keep a track of what God is saying in this time. So be like Elisha, who stuck, stuck, stuck to his, to his leader. And he said, I'm not leaving you until I receive blessing. I really, I, I really believe that's part of the role of teaching. And you know what happens? Here's a beautiful thing. When I teach, my people hear my voice. But guess what happens now? When Pastor Kilonzi receives that as his prophet's voice, and he begins to live it, and he passes it on, his people hear his voice. This is the order in the kingdom. It's not even about me. It's about his disciples hear his voice. And guess what happens? Their disciples hear, that's what Paul is saying, isn't it? And trust reliable people who are also... So it's not even, it's not even saying that, it, it, it's saying that in the house there is order. Even the new discipleship group is set up in a way that they listen to their disciple. Because they understand this disciple is under authority. And there's a safety in following somebody who's under authority. It's very, it's, it's, it makes a church a safe church. And so this is what we're doing. So number one, listen to the voice of your shepherd. Number two, actively seek the spiritual transfer. Actively seek spiritual transfer. Listen actively when you're in church. Never be one of those guys who's so busy serving tables that you never get to listen to the message. Hey, make sure, make sure you're out, you're sitting, you've got your notebook. Especially staff members, you guys can become Marthas very easily. Everybody else is being blessed in your church and you're just there doing cables. Let me just do them so after service I won't be running. And you miss the message and you miss the transfer. So actively seek that transfer. And when you receive it, take it as God's word. Be a Berean. Go and look at those scriptural references later. And say, Lord, confirm this word. Because guess what? It's God's word. It's not your pastor's word. So he's always a reference point. You're following me as I follow Jesus. So check it for yourself. So you're able to say, yes, my pastor is following. I confirm that that word is from the Lord. And then after that, understand that it's not just knowledge you're looking for. You're looking for impartation. You're looking for spiritual transfer. And it will come. It will come. So that's the second, the next thing is, 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 is uh, the third thing is pass on the teaching. <laughs> pass on the teaching. So here's what happens. As I receive the teaching, whether it's at family night, whether it's a service, I'm always looking to pass it on. If you have a discipleship group, and my prayer is everybody in this room, you're in a discipleship group and you're about to lead your own discipleship group if you're not leading it. But hey, this is when you start to practice teaching. Because what happens is we've made our... DGs for, for a very specific reason we've made our discipleship groups geographical and the reason is because we don't want people to say oh I was caught in traffic I was trying to cross town to go to the other side we want our groups to actually be able to meet physically if possible and we've said that our discipleship groups they meet on Wednesday uh, they meet on Wednesday after watching family night they can actually watch family night together or if that's too early in their day they can watch it on their way there and then eventually meet and have a meal and and share some of them maybe because of COVID and a few other things may be still doing virtual and that's okay. But ideally what we're aiming for is a place where we can sit, share a meal because remember, discipleship is life on life. It's you coming into my house and understanding where my fridge is because you're my spiritual children. That's a major difference. Tomorrow we'll talk a bit about the difference between a life group and a discipleship group. It's a world of a difference. Uh, you're coming into my house because you're my, you're my spiritual children. Then I come and visit your house and we have life group there because I want to know how my children live. When I visit you, I can tell things that I couldn't tell when you talked to me before. I can see some things are out of order. I can see the way you're treating your house help is not godly. That's a thing a father looks for. <laughs> because I want to be able to challenge you and say, hey, that lady looks miserable. She works for you. This is not what Christians do. This is discipleship, guys. Discipleship is not just teaching God's word. It's helping you apply God's word in your life. So, so as we meet in those places, as you've received family night, don't just listen for yourself. Listen because you understand I'm responsible to make sure this word gets to people. And then get an opportunity the first few minutes, do a summary. What did you hear God say? Because that's when you get to teach. And guess what's happening? Every one of us is learning to be a teacher because Paul says, and trust 
everyone in, in the Christian family, there's nobody who's not a teacher. Are there any shy people in the house? Let me just see. Shy people in the house? You struggle to teach in front of people. Let me just see. It's okay. Don't worry. I was going to say, what a bold church. There's nobody who's shy here. Of course they're here. Or oh, they're shy to raise their hands. <laughs> oh, Lord, help us. Don't you worry. Don't you worry. When the Spirit comes, He brings boldness. And you know what? This is just your role. It's like you can't be shy to teach your children. If you want your children to learn, you have to speak. So all of us are going to have to learn to teach. So take that word. And here's what they say. Things that are taught stick in your mind much more than when you don't teach it. So you take notes and then teach it. Guess what's going to happen? Because you're having to apply it so you can teach it, it's going to sink into your life even a lot more. So make sure you're passing it on. Uh, you gain a lot more when you do that. And then number, the, the last one, pray with authority, with authority and expectation of miracles. Listen to God's word and take it as his word, not just your pastor's word. And so as you pray for your people, pray with expectation of miracles. Uh, listen, when, 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 uh, when, when, I, when we talked about getting out of debt, and that was God's word to this church, if you're leading your discipleship group, you're like, guys, this is your word. You are getting out of debt. <laughs> this one is not, for our group, it's not even a choice. God has spoken. And so I'm praying and pray and anoint and say, you have a, a debt of how much? 10 million. We're trusting God as a miracle for all of us. Pray for miracles. Pray for miracles. Pray for healing. Pray for deliverance. Because God has given us that authority as teachers. That's, that, it just comes with being a kingdom teacher. Uh, in Luke chapter 10, verse 8 to 9, there's a very interesting uh, verse there. Luke chapter 10, just put that verse there. It says, when you enter a town and you're welcomed, eat what is offered to you. So Jesus is sending the 72 out. It says, when you enter into a town, eat what is offered to you when you're welcomed. And then he says, heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. Mm. <laughs> like you're entering into the house, they receive you, thank them. Even as you're teaching the word, pray for the sick. You know what? I'm coming to learn that God expects us to pray for the sick. He expects us to expect miracles. Sometimes we don't want to pray for the sick because I'm like, what if, what if the guy doesn't get healed? What if something doesn't happen? Why is that your business? Your business is to be faithful. See, Jesus has said, what has he said? Let's do that together. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. We want to tell people about the kingdom of God, but we don't want to heal the sick. But these two things go side by side. As we teach God's word, we expect miracles. As we do evangelism, we expect miracles. As we pray, we expect miracles. Miracles, is, it just goes with everything. It's part of it. By the way, whenever I pray for people, whenever I say, let me pray for you, and I'm doing evangelism, I'll pray, for, I'll pray an impossible prayer. I, I, I'm like, let me just try. Why, why can't we just trust God that this situation can end soon? Maybe even by next month. Can we pray that? <laughs> I'm like, Lord, you better come through right now because this guy needs to get saved. And I pray. And I'm like, give me your number. Let's keep track and want to see whether God answers this prayer. There's a way that I understand I can't outhype God. That's number one. And then number two, I understand that God's purposes are so huge. There are things he's doing in this person's life that maybe what I'm doing is sowing the seed and he will get healed eventually. Maybe God wants me just to have the, 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 to be there to allow this person to even start having faith that God can heal him. I don't know the purposes of God. All I know is that God has said, heal the sick and proclaim the kingdom. And so I, I pray for the healing. And I was telling guys earlier, when, I went to Mpige, when we went to Mpige, I love that those little kids, they have such a faith because what they do is they pray and then trust God for healing and then they pray again. So the little 15-year-old boy who took us to see his village, he told me, there's this guy, he told us, with Pastor Kelonzi, he told us, there's this guy who I prayed for, he's 70 years old. So this guy is 15. He said, there's a 70-year-old uh, guy, I prayed for him, and he was paralyzed. And uh, he couldn't move, hadn't moved for a long time. And so what I did is I told, him, I told him after I prayed, nothing happened when he prayed, but he said, I'll come next week and see what God has done. Mm. Ha, ha. I love it. <laughs> he's like, he's not discouraged, he's like, I'll come next week. See, we've prayed. So he came next week, he said he found the guy sitting on a chair. That guy had not sat for years. And then he's like, oh, God made you sit on a chair. Brilliant, but this is not his purpose for you. Let's pray that you can walk. So he prayed, and then he said, I'll come next week and we'll see what God has done. And sure enough, the next week he came and found the guy on a stick. And the guy was walking. And he's like, wow, this is so cool. Now, next week, 
we'll pray and see what God has done. So actually, what happened is when we were walking, he told us, the guy is walking on a stick, so I'm hoping you guys will see him because we're going to trust God that he walks perfectly. And so when we got there, the boy was preaching to his church. Note, to his church. He's 15 years old. Huh? So all of you who say, I'm not called, <laughs> shock on you. And the guy was preaching to his church. And as he's preaching, and by the way, his church was like, they range from 12 to like 5. Like just a bunch of kids. But he's teaching them the word as he received it from his pastor. In fact, what was so comical for us is he was saying the same things his pastor was saying. So his pastor had introduced his leaders, the leaders in the church. And the pastor would say, this one, this young girl, oh my gosh, this one is trouble. Don't mess with her. This one has the Holy Spirit. This one is serious. So when the guy came to introduce the church, he's like, yeah, let me introduce my church. Calls this girl. Yeah, I stand. Then he says, this one, this one is trouble, guys. Don't mess with her. The Holy Spirit. We're like, he's following hard. You know, kids just follow. So as we're doing the sermon and he's preaching, the, we just see a guy coming up the hill with his stick. And he's coming. And he sits there with those kids. And he listens. That 70-year-old is part of the 15-year-old's church. Because if you have been in bed for 10 years and then somebody came and prayed for you and you're walking, you don't care how old he is. He is your, he, you follow him. This guy came and listened to the whole sermon. After the end, the boy came. He finished the sermon. And he's like, okay, guys, uh, it's time for the pastor to pray for people. Why are you with you, one boy? <laughs> so you remember this story. So he said, it's time for the pastor to pray for people. So anybody with prayers, can, anybody with a prayer request can come and see the pastor. So we thought, like for me, I'm there. I'm like, usually when people say that in my presence, they mean go and see Pastor M. Shock on me. The kids all went and trooped and went to him. And he's just laying hands on them, praying for them. Then guess what? The old man goes and stands next to his pastor and starts telling him his issues. I said, oh my God. The guy calls us. In fact, he said, uh, pastors, come, 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 come. <laughs> So I was with Pastor, Pastor Sarah Mukisa, who is uh, Pastor's Apostle Moses' wife. So we're the ones he's calling, like, come, come, come. So we're like, hey, we're in, we're in a place of authority. We obey. We went running. He told us, lay hands on this man. We want to pray that God would first of all heal him. And then his son, he says his son is trying to poison him. And he wants the inheritance. So he's not even eating food in the house. A seven, you're entrusting a 15-year-old boy with the secrets of your life. And he says, so we're going to pray for him that the son will also get saved. So let's lay hands and let's pray. I said, Lord, forgive my lack of faith. I will never not pray for miracles again after this. I've been rebuked by a 15-year-old boy. Like, how can I even dare think that I'm not, that this, I'm, I'm exempt from this command? Pray for the sick. Pray for the sick and expect miracles and teach the kingdom of God. Guys, from today, no more baby prayers. Yeah. No more baby prayers. Don't start looking at yourself and saying, I wish I was Pastor Kilonzi. I wish I was Pastor Njora. I wish I was... No. You have the authority. Greater is he who is within you than he who is in the world. So pray and expect. And if the Lord doesn't do it, keep praying. Say next week. Let's see next week and let's pray again. And maybe the Lord just wants enough faith to build in this person. Eventually they'll be healed. But I'm going to be part of it. Yeah, the devil cannot be terrorizing people on my watch. So pray with authority. Anybody in your discipleship group who has an issue, it is your responsibility. Pray for those issues and expect miracles and put God to the test let him be the one who is ashamed me I'm like Lord if you're ashamed it's you me I did what your heart told me to do I prayed <laughs> amen yeah so even in this even this week we're going to pray for miracles by the way there are some of you who are sick and this is God's house how can you be sick and we're here yeah we want to pray for healing by the way Pastor James it's three and I want you guys to go home tomorrow who's leading prayer Pastor Milton pray for the sick. Can we make that a bit of a focus? Yeah. Tomorrow is miracle service. Yeah. Come. Six o'clock. Be here. So those of, you, those of you who live nearby, don't come at six. Come at 5.30 and start walking around and just creating an atmosphere of prayer. Let's just trust God for healing, for miracles, for signs and wonders. We count out. It's not us. It's him. If he really is in the building, he has to do what he does best. We can trust him to be the one who heals. Amen? So let's just stand up right now and just receive that word. I believe when God gives me a word, it's never for information, it's for transfer. Just claim that transfer for yourself right now. 
Just speak. Whatever word God gave you, whatever thing you remember, whatever phrase that stood out for you, claim that phrase for yourself right now. Lord, I'm a teacher of your word. Father God, your word is going to bring me life and set me free. Lord, I'm a son of this house. Father God, every word you've given, every promise you've given. Come on, come on, pray for yourself. I'm just helping you pray. Lord, every word you've given, every promise you've given for this house is my promise. Some of you, you had the promise of a good marriage. Claim that promise right now. Nobody will claim it for you. Hang on like Elisha, hang on to Elijah. Father God, I claim it. This is my portion in Christ Jesus. Some of you need to be claiming a portion of good children, of finances without pressure, because that's where your life has been. That is not the portion of this house. Come on, just claim it right now. Say, Lord, I need your anointing. I need you to fall on me. I need your blessing. Lord, I'm hanging on. I will be a teacher of your word. Lord, you will use me to bring miracles in my house. Miracles will follow me. Signs and wonders will follow me because I believe in you. Lord, this is what I'm claiming. Father God, I'm calling you right now to just be glorified in my life. I'm putting my life on the altar. You will use me, Lord. I will pray. I will share the gospel. I will teach God's word. And I will trust you for healing and miracles. Lord, you're going to come through through me. You're building me up, Lord, to be a man of authority. You're building me up to be a prophet in my generation. I will do greater things than those who are ahead of me because you're giving me your spiritual transfer. Lord, I'm here for you, Lord. I want you to use me. I want you to glorify yourself in my generation through me. If you can use anybody, Lord, you can use me. Come on, somebody just speak to your father right now. Claim your inheritance in him. Ah, uh, He wants you to claim it. It's yours. It's yours. It's your gift. It's yours. It's your gift. Ah, uh, How can people be sick in your family? How can people be sick in your office? How can people be walking around dead spiritually? Lord, I need your power. I need your anointing. Fall on me, Lord Jesus. Father God, I'm calling you for anointing. I'm calling upon you for miracles. I'm calling on, upon you for spiritual gifts. Release them upon me, Lord. Release them on your children. Do what only you can do, Lord. We bless you, Jesus. We honor you, Lord. We bless you for your anointing, Lord. You're such a good God. We love you, Jesus. Let your anointing fall upon us, Lord. We love you, Lord. Let's sing these words together. Anointing, fall on me. the power of the Holy Ghost fall on me, anointing fall on me. Your spirit fall on me, your spirit, your, your spirit, let him fall on me, your spirit. something right now that we don't often do just if we could all go on our knees right now in the presence of the of God Lord we your children are waiting upon you we're waiting on you Lord fall on us Lord we want your spirit to fall on us we're hungry for you. We're desperate for you, Lord. Father God, we just come before you to say we need you. Lord, if you don't go before us, we will not go. Don't send your angels. Send your presence. We need you to take us into the promised land. We need you to keep your promises to us. Lord Jesus, we need you because we cannot do this on our own. It's Jesus we're following. It's Him we're hungry for. And so pour down your Spirit, Lord. Pour down the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Pour down the power of the Holy Spirit. Pour down the healing of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, right now I pray. I know tomorrow we're having a healing service. But I recognize there may be people right now in this place who are in pain. People who are watching this who are in pain. 
And Lord, why wait till tomorrow when you're here to heal them? And so if this is you, I'm just asking you to raise your hands in faith right now. As I pray for you, Father God, look at every hand that is raised in this house of sons and daughters who are saying, Lord, there is pain in my life, there is pain in my body. And Lord, I do not know what is ailing them right now. But I thank you that you know every single one of us and not only do you know us, you know the hairs on our heads. You know the cells in our bodies. You know what we need to be whole. And Lord, I'm speaking right now that you would bring spare parts from heaven for those parts that need to be replaced. I'm praying that Lord Jesus, you would bring healing, the healing balm of Gilead for that pain that needs to go away. And Lord, I pray that right now you'd bring sound mind for that person who's even been confused in how they respond. And Lord, I'm praying right now, we're trusting you for a miracle. We're asking that Lord, you'd fall down right now and that you would do it. And right now, even as your hand is raised, I declare God's healing over you. I declare that the Holy Spirit is coming upon you right now and that His power is coming upon you and that you're experiencing the power of the Holy Ghost right now and that God is beginning to do the work of restoration, that God is beginning to do the work of healing in your life and that you would testify that God is our healer. And Lord Jesus, just fall right now, right now, in Jesus' name, I speak healing over that person whose leg has been hurting. I speak healing over you right now in Jesus' name. You will not limp again. You will walk in freedom. This is God's portion for you. I declare over you who's been troubled. You've not even been sleeping because of the, the anxiety you felt. I'm speaking over you sound sleep in Jesus' name. That you will no longer be anxious. But faith in the Lord will keep you. You will sleep like a baby tonight because of your father being in the house. And I declare for every single one of you who's trusting God for healing. May His Spirit just transfer into you right now and bring His deliverance. And may you testify in this gathering that the Lord has healed you. And so Father, we thank you because you're here. We pray with trust and thanksgiving because we know you've heard us. And Lord, our bodies are here now. We're saying use us. Use us. We put ourselves down as a living sacrifice. Lord, may we be holy and acceptable to you. And we're saying, Lord, if you can use anything, Lord, you can use us. We want to see our families come to you. We want to see our neighbors come to you. We want to see our office colleagues come to you. We want Jesus to overflow, the aroma of Christ to overflow in our lives. And Lord, we want to represent you as ambassadors, worthy ambassadors of the kingdom. And so Lord, we recommit ourselves to you again. And we say, Lord, just open our hearts wide that we can receive everything you have for us. Lord, we commit tomorrow to you. And we pray that, Lord Jesus, you would do the work that you plan to do. And that, Lord, as we've prayed before, none of us would leave the same. Even today, there'd be something already that has happened that has changed our reality. Every day, there are new mercies that you're going to bring. And we're trusting you for those mercies, Lord. And so right now, just begin to thank God. Begin to thank God for healing. Thank God for anointing. Come on, just open your mouth. Thank Him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, because you've anointed us. Thank you, Lord, for the blessings of this house. Thank you that, Lord, I'm here. Thank you for this church. Thank you that I'm part of the family of God. Thank you that you're the one who's building your church and the gates of hell have nothing on us. Thank you because, Lord, we are going to invade those gates of hell and people are going to come to Jesus. Thank you for your promises that are true for us, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We bless you, Jesus. We honor you. And, Lord, we pray all these things in faith that you have heard us and that you have done it. For we pray this in the mighty and matchless name of our Lord and Savior Jesus and God's people say, Amen. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. Amen.